So I'll just go ahead and get started. I, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. And I wanna thank everyone who joined us for any of the four sessions for this year's virtual Fair Housing Summit. The pandemic this last year has made it increasingly obvious that safe, affordable housing is a critical need in every community in our country. The Fair Housing Act was passed to ensure that no one is denied this essential need because of their race, color, national origin, or creed. And fair housing rights have changed and expanded over the years to include sex and gender, sexual orientation in some cases, familial status, and people with disabilities. As housing advocates, we need to stay vigilant to ensure that these rights are afforded to everyone who faces discrimination based on who they are. And we need to make sure these rights are maintained, protected, and enforced. And that brings us to our speaker today for the final session of our, our four session Fair Housing Summit this April, which is Fair Housing Month. We're going to hear from Rachel Wentworth. She's the Executive Director of the Housing Equality Center of Pennsylvania. The mission of the Housing Equality Center is to advance fair and equal access to housing opportunities for all Pennsylvanians. Before becoming the executive director, Rachel served as both the assistant director and as test coordinator. And we're gonna learn more about what testing is and what that means. Rachel has 20 years of experience in fair housing, including test coordination in the areas of rentals, sales, insurance, lending and accessibility, complaint resolution, fair housing education and technical assistance to local governments uh, and housing providers and capacity building for other agencies, you know, such as North Penn Legal and other folks who do um, fair housing work. Um, so she has a, a long career in, in fair housing work and testing, and she's going to walk us through current trends and new developments in testing, policies, enforcement, and compliance. Before we have her start, I just want to do, you know, some, some brief ground rules. Because this is a CLE offering, we're going to have two polls launched during the event. Um, they're just going to pop up on your screen. We'll give you a little warning that they're coming up um, and you need to just click that you're, you're still with us and, and paying attention. Um, I'll have everyone put their questions in the chat box and I'm going to monitor that. And the session is broken up into sections and it will make sense to save questions about that section for the end of that section. So, um, you know, just try to be patient. We'll, we'll try to get to every question that, that gets asked. We are recording this session, um, just so, so everyone knows. And um, I think that's all the ground rules that I have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm going to just take a minute to share my screen. Um, And I hope everybody can see. It's there. Yeah, let me just get to get to a slideshow here. I have part of part of Zoom covering up part of my screen. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Um, so as Sarah said, my name is Rachel Wentworth. I am the executive director of the Housing Equality Center of Pennsylvania. And we serve both the greater Philadelphia area and the Lehigh Valley in terms of um, taking complaints of discrimination for consumers, doing testing investigations and assisting with enforcement services, and then also doing education and technical assistance programs, um, education both to consumers and compliance education to housing providers, social service agencies, local government. So that's what we do in a, in a nutshell. Um, our organization solely handles fair housing issues. And so um, I was asked to cover a couple of different topics here, and I'm going to take them in a little bit different order than, um, than the title suggests. The first two things that I'm gonna talk about are just some uh, HUD policy updates, um, a recap of the um, back and forth over the last few years with regards to policies around affirmatively furthering fair housing and disparate impact. I'm gonna talk about race, national origin, and familial status, um, just some of the 
trends that we're seeing in these areas, some um, ongoing discrimination issues that we see regarding each of these protected classes and um, a few newer trends that have arisen in recent years, I would say. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about fair housing testing, what fair housing testing is, what purpose it plays in the work that we do, and what it tells us about discrimination, specifically on the three protected classes that I'm going to be focused on, but also a little bit um, of what we see in a disability context. So I'm going to skip right over kind of a fair housing 101, because um, I think that if this is the fourth session, you've probably heard lots about the um, basic provisions of the Fair Housing Act. But one of the less commonly discussed provisions of the Fair Housing Act is the affirmatively furthering fair housing obligation. And I think a lot of people in recent years have seen these redlining maps. Um, and this is just one example of an area where federal housing policy in our country has created and perpetuated segre segregated housing patterns. So the redlining maps that we, I think we've probably all seen in recent years in various articles and studies about the issue of redlining and lending um, arose from a New Deal program in 1933 that was essentially a mortgage rescue program. Um, it was a program that was designed to refinance the loans of homeowners who were in default during the Great Depression into a low interest, fully amortizing, typically at that point, 15 to 25 year loan that was um, insured by the federal government. And so as part of these, um, this mortgage rescue program, um, all of the major metropolitan areas of the United States were classified according to this sort of four tiered system of um, what the risk was to the federal government in ensuring these loans. Um, and the, the categories were green, blue, yellow, and red, with green being um, typically the more suburban, uh, less dense, newer housing, and white residents. Through the blue and yellow tiers to red, which was typically the um, older, more urban, um, and Black residents, sometimes immigrant residents, were these neighborhoods were classified in this red category and were um, excluded from, from this loan program. So this is just one of the examples um, of a federal federal policy that work to um, worsen fair housing issues and um, decrease access for certain protected classes. So when the Fair Housing Act was passed um, in 1968, the, the act not only prohibited discrimination in housing in all of the areas that we've been hearing about um, throughout this summit, sales, rentals, and so forth, but it also imposed a duty on the federal government to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, and I think a lot of us have heard recently about affirmatively furthering fair housing as if this was something new, and I think it's really important to know that this is an obligation that's existed in the statute from its inception in 1968. So what affirmatively furthering fair housing means is basically um, that the federal government has an obligation to implement programs in a way that 
begin to reverse the effects of the, the past policies that perpetuated segregation. Um, it goes beyond simply the duty to comply with the Fair Housing Act by not discriminating, but it requires some sort of affirmative um, activities to undo past effects of segregation and discrimination. So th this obligation um, applies primarily to both public housing authorities and CDBG entitlement jurisdictions. And both of those entities are required in some way, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the ways that that has differed over time, to develop some kind of analysis of the local impediments to fair housing choice within their jurisdiction, um, and then to develop a plan to address those barriers or those impediments, and then to according to that plan, according to those strategies are, that are identified to take appropriate actions to overcome the effects of those barriers. And then of course the jurisdiction or the housing authority is required to keep documentation of both the analysis and the actions that are taken. So many of um, many organizations, um, including the, the Housing Equality Center and North Penn Legal Services uh, and lots of social service agencies, lots of municipalities are subrecipients of CDBG funding that we receive funding um, from those entitlement jurisdictions as a subrecipient. And so subrecipient agencies don't have their own requirement to develop a plan for, a further, for affirmatively furthering fair housing, but these subrecipient organizations should be involved in the process of fair housing planning and carrying out the actions that are identified. Um, subrecipients are also obligated to comply with fair housing laws. Obviously, the um, entitlement jurisdictions and housing authorities are uh, required to provide the training and oversight to their staff to ensure that all of those staff comply with the Fair Housing Act. So um, for most of the decades following the passage of the Fair Housing Act, there wasn't any specific requirements or process for these entities to appropriately carry out their affirmatively furthering fair housing obligations. Um, in about 1992, there was a fair housing planning guide that was developed that required um, an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, which was a kind of loose uh, process that would um, identify, you know, as the name suggests, impediments to fair housing choice. And um, then have a plan to carry it out. That was, um, there wasn't really any HUD oversight of that process. And um, there were multiple studies that took place that um, demonstrated how inadequate and how much confusion and how uneven that process played out amongst all of the different jurisdictions in all of the different regions. So um, to arrive at more clarity and more consistency um, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2015, HUD published, um, it was called the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Final Rule. And so that replaced the previous process with um, a new, process that was called the assessment of fair housing um, 
along with that HUD provided a really structured tool for carrying out that analysis um, and provided a lot of data um, and mapping tools that would help the jurisdictions to fulfill that that fair housing planning obligation. And so the intent of this was really to um, create clearer expectations and a more structured process to carry out this obligation. And it also uh, implemented kind of a higher level of HUD oversight, that there was a formal review process to make sure that the, the plans were adequate and appropriate. So in May of 2018, HUD suspended this rule and withdrew the fair housing assessment tool. Um, I'm gonna keep saying it probably on every slide that this didn't affect the actual statutory, 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 um, requirement to affirmatively furthering fair housing. And um, it just rolled back that formal um, assessment process. So initially, the, the intent was to revise the data and mapping tools and the training process. Um, during this period, there was kind of a, a mixed set of requirements because the jurisdictions had, that hadn't submitted a assessment of fair housing were required to go back to the previous analysis of impediments process. And the jurisdictions that had submitted an assessment of fair housing had to continue executing the goals that were defined in that um, document. So in August of 2020, HUD replaced the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule with what was called the preserving community and neighborhood choice rule. Again, it does not remove the statutory requirements to affirmatively further fair housing. Basically lifted all of those requirements to do a formal fair housing planning process and just required the CDBG jurisdictions to self-certify, um, to document in you know, whatever way of their choice that they are um, taking active steps to meet their affirmatively furthering fair housing obligations, but removed any formal process for doing that. Um, and again, as, as fair housing advocates and as um, being in frequent communication with these, the jurisdictions, which, you know, I, I believe in our area are genuinely, um, you know, interested in following the, the letter and the spirit of the Fair Housing Act that this is a really, really concerning step because I think it offered kind of the false um, impression to jurisdictions that they no longer had to um, undertake significant steps to affirmatively further fair housing because of the documentation um, and the oversight being decreased. So um, in January of this year, there was a memo to the Secretary of HUD that, in, that instructed HUD to um, take actions to remedy the history of discriminatory housing, and in particular, um, mentioned both the affirmatively furthering fair housing requirement and disparate impact, which I'll, I'll discuss in the next section. So just a couple of weeks ago, I think it was April 12th, the um, reinstatement of the previous 2015 rule was submitted to the OMB for, for review. Um, and I think that there's been a little bit of uh, speculation about how this process will happen. The new AFFH rule was had some 
irregularities concerning what would be the normal rulemaking process. So, um, you know, wh where we are now is that that the reinstatement of this rule has been submitted for review, and um, you know, we're we're kind of staying tuned to to see what the next steps will be on this. So Rachel, one quick question on affirmatively furthering before we before we move on. Mm -hmm. um, has it traditionally been a, a problem um, where municipalities would just ignore this or not sufficiently create a, a plan? And then what would be the penalties for that? What would be the so we've seen um, just even even locally, we've certainly seen a variety of choice of approaches from jurisdictions who are very conscientious about completing the the AIs um, to other jurisdictions where um, you know there are much longer time periods between um, AIs than than what was supposed to be appropriate, you know, seeing seeing jurisdictions go like eight, 10, 15 years between analysis of impediments. Um, and also, yes, you know, very inadequate um, considerations of what the fair housing issues are. We, we've seen some locally in the um, suburban Philadelphia area, some of the individual municipalities um had some had some ais on record that basically said we don't have any fair housing uh problems and um one of the things in recent i'd say recent decades that's that's arisen has been um there've been a number of lawsuits that were actually filed under the False Claims Act, um, not the Fair Housing Act, where the allegation was that um, the municipality or the or the county had accepted this funding had signed off on the certification that they were affirmatively furthering fair housing and then had not met those obligations that were a condition of the funding. So that was one of the consequences under the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, the 2015 rule, a consequence is certainly that if it's not adequate that, that the funding can be held up. So, um, and then there's certainly the possibility of liability under the Fair Housing Act for not um, meeting those obligations. All right, and thanks. I, sh oh, <laughs> sorry, I should say that one of the one of the other things that under the 2015 rule, there was a public participation requirement that required, um, you know, kind of the gathering of stakeholder information, both from various organizations um, and also the public at large. And do we have any other questions on affirmatively furthering fair housing? I am not seeing any right now. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to disparate impact. Um, so disparate impact, um, I'm going to try to try to explain this as as straightforwardly as possible. Um, disparate impact kind of goes by two names, either disparate impact or discriminatory effects. And this refers to policies that are facially neutral, um, but they have a discriminatory effect on a particular protected class. Um, so these are policies where there's no intention to discriminate on the part of the housing provider, but the effect is to have um, a some sort of negative impact on one of the protected classes. And later on in the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about a recent uh, pending case that we have that deals with a number of disparate impact policies. Um, so historically, 
the both HUD and federal courts have interpreted the Fair Housing Act to um, prohibit not only intentional discrimination, but also disparate impact discrimination. Um, and so historically, these policies that while worded in a neutral way, when they have a discriminatory effect can result in Fair Housing Act liability for the housing provider or the local government. Um, so in 2013, HUD published a final rule that was entitled Implementation of the Fair Housing Act's Discriminatory Effect Effects Standard. And this just, you know, um, formalized this disparate impact theory of housing discrimination. And one of the most important things that it that it established was what we call this three-part burden shifting standard to determine whether a neutral policy does or does not violate the Fair Housing Act. And I'll give you an example, kind of one of my favorite disparate impact examples um, to illustrate this burden shifting standard. So about 20-ish years ago, all of the major homeowners insurance providers, um, you know, the state farms, the nationwides, the all states were sued for race discrimination. Um, and some of the some of the behavior that that prompted these lawsuits um, was disparate treatment was um, individuals being treated differently because of their race. But a major part of these lawsuits involved policies with a disparate impact. Um, and so one, some examples of these was um, the insurance companies would not write policies for homes that had flat roofs or homes that were over a certain age or under a certain market value. And that's a neutral policy. Um, it's not, does not explicitly discriminate in any way, but anybody with um, knowledge of particularly our Northeastern mid-Atlantic region knows that um, it's the older, more urban, more predominantly minority areas that are more likely to be affected by a policy like this. So in the three-step burden shifting standard, the first step of this is that the complainant needs to show that this policy impacts a particular protected class more than the general population. Um, and in this case, it was fairly easy to do a statistical analysis that said that these policies would exclude a lot of urban areas. I mean, city of Philadelphia, um, city of Allentown, other, um, other local urban areas, um, whole neighborhoods of those cities would be excluded. So then the respondent needs to show that there was a non-discriminatory justification for having that policy. And it has to be a legitimate substantial interest. Um, and in this case, you know, that the, the defense was um, that these structural issues caused more risk. Um, and then the third step is that the complainant then has the burden to show that that interest could be served by a policy or practice that has a less discriminatory effect. So in this case, there might be a, a less discriminatory effect by having a more um, robust inspection policy or um, addressing this through pricing or some other type of model rather than completely excluding these types of homes. So that's the um, 2013 disparate impact rule. Um, and again, in 2020, we had a new final rule that addressed uh, disparate impact. And basically, I think that the, the takeaway from the new rule was 
just that it made it very, very, very difficult for a complainant to prove discrimination based on di disparate impact. Um, there were a lot of different um, burdens of proof that had to be met very, very early on in the complaint process. Um, you know, that there were a lot of requirements for demonstrating that a disparate impact policy serves no justifiable purpose prior to the ability to conduct any kind of discovery in the case. So, um, you know, requiring proving something that uh, a complainant would not possibly have the, the information available to do so at a, a very early stage in the filing process. Um, there was a new burden shifting test developed um, that I, I have it summarized on the next slide. I don't think I'm going to go through it in a, in a whole bunch of detail, but it was basically a much, much, much higher level of proof for the complainant and a number of defenses were provided to the respondent for, you know, how they could, how they could rebut um, allegations of disparate impact. And then there was this exemption for predictive models. Um, and so I think another thing that's come recently into the news um, and various articles and studies is this whole idea of algorithmic bias. And, you know, is moving from um, a system in things like housing-related financial transactions, mortgage lending, homeowner's insurance, where individual loan officers or homeowner's insurance have a, homeowner's insurance agents have a lot of discretion and therefore potential discrimination is moving to a more computerized algorithmic model for qualifying um, individuals better or does it introduce other types of bias? So a concern with, with this rule was that they just offered an exemption for um, predictive models. And then there was an additional exemption for, um, you know, if there was a discriminatory, a policy with a discriminatory effect that was implemented to serve some sort of third party requirement that that was another exemption. So kind of a lot of loopholes in this new rule. And, um, you know, he, here's the revised burden shifted standard. I think in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through this in um, great detail, but basically the takeaway again is that this, this is, you know, from an advocacy perspective, I would say kind of anti-complainant, but basically, it, again, it made it very, very difficult for a, um, an individual to allege discriminant, disparate impact successfully. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about the, the comment process in this particular rule is that a lot of large banks and homeowners insurance agents actually, or homeowners insurance companies actually submitted comments um, supporting keeping the previous rule and in opposition to, to this rule. Because even though um, this rule might have benefited them in making it harder for consumers to file fair housing, complaints against them, that from an ethical point of view, even the, you know, even the Wells Fargo's and, and state farms of the world that um, sometimes advocates view as adversaries really, um, from an ethical point of view, wanted to hold themselves to a higher standard and submitted um, comments in opposition to HUD adopting this rule. So right after the um, final rule was announced prior to the implementation date, there were, there were three separate lawsuits that were almost immediately um, 
filed against HUD with the intent of blocking the implementation of this rule. So in one of those cases, it's a case out of Massachusetts, there was an injunc injunction issued one day prior to what would have been the effective date, which prevented HUD from enforcing this rule. Um, and among the, among the court's observation in this injunction was that it represented a massive overhaul of the 2013 rule and that HUD's justifications for changing the rule were inadequate. Um, and, you know, I, I think there was some discussion about it being um, contrary to this previous case law and precedent um, that supported that the Fair Housing Act intends liability for, for cases of disparate impact. So again, um, this month, the, the reinstatement of the 2013 rule was also submitted for, for review. So those two rules kind of a different a different pattern uh, regarding the rulemaking process and the and the reason for withdrawing the uh, you know the 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 path is a little bit different but now these both disparate impact and affirmatively furthering fair housing are are being reconsidered so Great. any any disparate impact questions <laughs> One one question that I have is, um, do we is there any way to know what kind of timeline there might be for for the OMB review to conclude and move this along? I don't think so. We we have a um, we have a monthly HUD meeting, and certainly all of the fair housing organizations were asking if we could know anything about either of those, and as of Two weeks ago, HUD meeting, we were told no that they couldn't give us a, <laughs> they couldn't give us um, kind of any more detailed information. So, so since there was the injunction issued in Massachusetts, um, is any sort of currently active litigation just sort of on hold pending a decision? So initially in that case, um, HUD had appealed, but then with the transition um, to the new administrations, my understanding is that HUD did withdraw the appeal in that case, but I haven't been following kind of the, the status of each of those in detail. All right, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Did anybody have anything they wanted to know about either affirmatively furthering or um, disparate impact? And if you do, go ahead and throw your question in the chat and we can get to it when we get to it. But I'm not seeing anything right now, Rachel. Okay, I think Tim wants to do his poll now. Yep, Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna put that up. I'll leave it up for about two minutes. And uh, in the meantime, you can continue with the presentation. I think if you answer the poll, it will uh, uh, take it off your screen. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to move on to just talking a little bit more in detail about race, national origin, and familial status. I'm going to talk um, just generally in in these next few slides about what kinds of um, activities or conduct the Fair Housing Act prohibits. Um, and I think, let's see, here we go. Uh, so I think that conceptually race discrimination is one of the most straightforward in, in most of our minds as far as housing discrimination and um, what type of conduct is prohibited. And so I'm not going to comment too, too specifically. You know, we, we definitely still see race discrimination in all housing related transactions. We still receive complaints. Um, in rentals, in sales transactions, in mortgage and homeowners 
transactions. I think that the issue of appraisals is starting to get some attention. Um, Philadelphia held a hearing um, a couple of days ago on this issue in the city of Philadelphia. And there have been a number of articles recently that, that probably some of you have seen about um, appraisals differing based on race. So, um, you know, race discrimination is often subtle. We, we say a lot that it's um, with a smile and a handshake that it's very, very, very rare. And I think only um, once in my career have I ever encountered kind of a really overt, um, explicit case of somebody being told that they were being denied housing because of their race. Um, we do see sometimes um, housing providers saying something of a racial nature to, for example, a white tester or a, um, a third party or another employee, but not um, very, very uncommon for a consumer to experience uh, race discrimination, where they're told that that's the reason for a denial. <coughs> um, so this, in race discrimination in particular, this is um, where testing becomes invaluable because it allows us to compare the, the treatment of two individuals. And um, one of the things that we see is voice profiling. Um, this is actually one of the areas where we get the greatest differences in treatment when we do testing is that um, a housing provider inferring the race of an individual based on the way that they sound on the phone and, you know, engaging in behavior from just not returning a call to offering um, either housing choices or terms and conditions that are inferior based on just that phone contact. contact. Um, you know, I think that we're seeing ongoing redlining concerns um, in regard to financing, things like the locations of bank branches and loan officers, uh, just making those products less available in some neighborhoods. As I mentioned before, developing concerns regarding bias in algorithms and um, those qualification standards that don't necessarily involve human uh, involvement in the qualification process. And then we see some disparate impact issues, uh, particularly in choices of particular complexes or landlords refusing to accept vouchers and opposition to multifamily and affordable housing that sometimes do have a discriminatory intent based on race, but sometimes, um, you know, the issue is a disparate impact that a neutral policy is having more of an effect on based on race. Rachel, I have a, a question about that, but mm -hmm. last comment. Um, so it has come up, um, Locally, we have a lot of people trying to use housing choice vouchers. Um, there's not a lot of housing available. I think that's a nationwide problem. And um, in our area in the Lehigh Valley, um, some people have brought up whether there's a, a discrimination based on source of income mm -hmm. as far as using a, a housing choice voucher. And there, there is not that I know of in Pennsylvania. Right. Um, I think Pittsburgh tried to do it a couple of years ago and, and ran into some trouble. I'm not sure about Philadelphia. Um, if there's not a, if that's not one of the standards, um, you know, a, a, as far as uh, discriminating against source of income, could someone still bring a, 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 a disparate impact case against someone? 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, and Philadelphia does have a source of income protection. It's, you know, aside from Pittsburgh, it's the only place, it, to my knowledge, in Pennsylvania that does. So they actually, despite outlawing um, discrimination against voucher holders, continue to have a huge problem with that there. But yeah, so here's an example um, of a case that we're looking at locally is that we had a situation where there's an apartment complex that for a long time did decide to um, did take did accept housing vouchers and decided about halfway through the pandemic that they were no longer going to accept housing vouchers. Um, so they non renewed everyone. Um, this is a, a municipality that's something like 97% uh, white and um, they had about 20 to 24 families that were voucher holders. We've had some discussions with the housing authorities involved, and those were all 24 of them, either families that were Black or had um, household members with disabilities. So, you know, that would be an example of potentially a situation where there could be a disparate impact argument made. Um, just an example of one that we're looking, looking at in a very preliminary way. And disparate impact cases, you know, I'm not going to lie, are, are difficult. And, and I'll, at the end of this section, I'll talk about one that we have going on currently that was, you know, just an example of one that is, there's, there's definitely enough there for us to choose to go forward with a complaint. But um, I think that sort of scenario is an example where there's, there's definitely a disparate impact argument to be made. Um, we're trying to explore how successful we think that might be. Um, I think other source of income issues are a little more clear cut when it's something like SSDI that is virtually inseparable from disability, that to, you know, to refuse that as a source of income is effectively denying people based on disability. So um, a, a few things about national origin discrimination. Um, this, this is defined pretty broadly. It can include, um, you know, any type discrimination based on any type of physical, cultural, or linguistic characteristics that are associated with a foreign geographic area. Um, it's important to note that immigration status does not affect fair housing rights. Um, anybody can file a discrimination complaint regardless of immigration status. Um, and of course, housing discrimination based on any of the other protected classes. So familial status, um, disability are illegal regardless of immigration status. Different terms and conditions based on national origin are illegal. We've seen um, situations where immigrants are um, required to pay more security deposit or made to pay prepay a certain number of rent months of rent ahead of time that's that's illegal and then intimidation or or threatening anyone um, based on their exer exercising their rights under the fair housing act is illegal and this would include threats to report a person to U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement if they file a fair housing complaint. Um, and we, we've had a couple of cases where um, we had landlords that were kind of targeting um, undocumented immigrants to rent to them engaging in exploitive fees and penalties, um, you know, charging things like 
per capita charges for children and so forth. And then if anybody objected, they would, you know, they would threaten to report them for being undocumented. Um, requiring tenants or applicants to be citizens or to have a particular immigration status is considered to be direct evidence of discrimination. Um, and housing providers need to apply the same type of documentation and qualification process for all potential residents. They can't require certain types of documentation only um, when they perceive that somebody is not a citizen or is an immigrant. And then we have some recent case law on the issue of requiring a social security number. Um, this obviously disproportionately excludes families that come from another country. And there was a, a case from Virginia a couple of years ago that found that requiring that all applicants have a social security number without accepting alternative proof of qualifications was um, a violation of the Fair Housing Act based on national origin. Um, another just piece of guidance that was released not too far, uh, not too long ago, is guidance regarding persons with limited English proficiency. And this basically says that uh, limited English proficiency is effectively to discriminate against somebody because they don't speak English or because they don't speak English well is effectively national origin discrimination. Um, and that there's no permissible reason for requiring that a tenant be able to speak English. Rachel, really quick before we move mm -hmm. on. This question actually came up in a prior session um, uh, as far as, you know, whether, so I'm glad that you answered it, that it is mm -hmm. illegal to discriminate um, uh, against, you know, immigrants regardless of their status. Mm -hmm. But in practice, um, do you see people who are undocumented trying to enforce that that right? I mean, if they still make themselves visible, that puts them still at risk. Right. Of people yeah, we we do not. We have I have I've only encountered one situation, and it was a case that involved something like fifteen individual complainants. So I think that there was kind of a safety in numbers. Um, perception where it was it it was the case that I was talking about with the per capita children you know per capita charges based on um, children and then the threatening to to report tenants that we do see an enormous reluctance to file discrimination complaints if people are undocumented for certain so um you know, it's, it's, I think that some of these potentially we could, if there was strong testing evidence or other type of evidence, it would be something that we could pursue as an organizational complaint. Um, and we've, we've certainly done that when we have bona fide complainants that aren't willing to file on their own behalf, but it, it's definitely a challenge. And obviously, we have landlords who who know that's a challenge, and and therefore are, you know, will engage in that type of conduct because they know their their chances of having any consequences are not very great. So a little bit on on families with children, um, another type of discrimination that we continue to see. Denying housing to families with children is illegal. Um, senior housing under some specific guidelines under the Housing for Older Persons Act are permitted to exclude families with children, but they have to conform to the Housing for Older Persons Act requirements. Um, segregating housing, so families with children are only permitted in certain buildings or certain floors, 
um, any rules that restrict parents and children or boys and girls from sharing a bedroom are impermissible under the Fair Housing Act and restricting children because of unsafe conditions. Um, the unsafe conditions is one that we see fairly um, often. I think we've seen locally um, in certain counties, some unintended consequences of uh, municipalities requiring more strict lead remediation requirements um, has has resulted in families with children with young children being denied because the the landlords don't want to remediate lead. And then any type of terms and conditions issues. So charging higher rent or higher security deposit per capita charges, um, unless those are very, very, very well documented. Um, you know, if the landlord pays the water and can document that, you know, each additional person will use $15 more of water per month, that might be acceptable. Um, but in general, per, per capita charges um, are going to be considered to be discriminatory against families with children. And then any type of rules and regulations that treat children under 18 differently from adults in the use of housing facilities. You know, we have uh, apartments that'll say, you know, children cannot play outside. Um, and if there's if there if the rules like that, they need to apply to tenants in general, um, rather than specifically singling out children. So this is a current um, example. This is a, a pending case that we have. So I, I can't identify um, the identity of the property management company. Um, but this is an example kind of combining all of the protected classes that we talked about, as well as the um, concept of disparate impact. And so this, this case was prompted by a, um, a Mexican man who contacted us because they, he was denied an apartment. His wife is from Colombia. She's a legal immigrant and she does not yet have a social security number. Um, and they were denied because of that reason. And so we did some further investigation of this complex and, and uncovered quite a few disparate impact issues. So the social security number is one. They also have a blanket ban on all criminal records, which, um, you know, we don't have time in the in the scope of this particular training to go into to detail regarding um, HUD's guidance on criminal records and it at what point criminal record policies have a disparate impact based on recent national origin. But HUD has said that a blanket ban on all criminal records, um, regardless of recency or severity is going to um, have a dif disparate impact based on race. This management company also had an occupancy policy that limited um, residents to three occupants in a two bedroom unit and four occupants in a three bedroom unit. <clears throat> and all of these complexes were in municipalities where the the local codes indicated that the bedroom should be large enough to permit two to three people per bedroom. And then we conducted testing of this apartment complex and the, um, the testers were told that each adult must qualify independently, even if they were married. So this is a policy that can exclude individuals, um, can exclude families where there's a stay at home parent, which is statistically more likely to be a, a woman. So this is a disparate impact um, on both familial status and sex. So this is, this is just an example of how disparate impact um, can look in a, 
in a real world example. Rachel, um, that sounds like a, a really interesting case. <laughs> there is a lot, certainly a lot going on there. Um, mm -hmm. We did get a couple questions that sort of moved back into um, the requirement of showing social security numbers. Mm -hmm. So some folks from local housing authorities were chiming in to say, one, um, they are hearing that when their voucher holders are calling for apartments, they're just sort of immediately being told, hey, we don't take section eight, um, like mm -hmm. right off the bat. So just right. access is a big problem. I right. think we all recognize right. that. Um, but then there was a question about um, HUD requiring um, public housing applicants or voucher uh, applicants to verify citizen status and social security numbers. So can you talk a right. little bit about why right. that might be okay? Yeah. So um, in any situation, there are a lot of areas where um, HUD program rules and the Fair Housing Act um, intersect in not so um, easy ways sometimes. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, my, my recommendation is really to um, talk to your HUD monitor about, um, you know, th there are particular HUD programs that have immigration requirements. Um, and, you know, to just check with your HUD monitor about making sure that those requirements are being implemented in a way that doesn't violate the Fair Housing Act. There's a lot of sticky, I think, sticky situations regarding HUD program rules for various housing programs and um, immigration and disability in particular and how how you meet the requirements of both the, the program rules and the Fair Housing Act. And I was gonna say also the previous question about source of income is that something that um, we've definitely had uh, housing authorities and other client serving organizations approach us with the suspicion that some housing providers may be accepting uh, vouchers from some applicants and not others that that there may be some um, disparate treatment going on based on race. So if you ever suspect anything like that, you can contact us about doing some testing. And I wasn't sure. It seemed like someone was trying to raise their hand to, to uh, ask a question. So if you're out there and you wanted to ask a question, you can unmute yourself now. And if it was a mistake, that's fine too. <laughs> um, and someone is is saying in the comments that they, they lost their sound. So I don't know, Tim, if you want to check on that and see if you can help them out. But we're, I think, ready to move on to testing, which I am okay. <laughs> interested in. So yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So fair housing testing. Um, and this is... Uh, you know, tend, tends to be something that people are, are, are pretty interested in. Um, and it's one of the core services that, that our organization offers. Um, and testing essentially is mystery shopping. Um, we have testers who are trained to do this, um, who essentially mystery shop the practices of housing providers or providers of um, housing related financial transactions. So loan officers, homeowners insurance providers, um, and often but not always testing is um, done in a way so we're we're sending multiple testers with that differ um, only on their protected class to a provider and see whether they're treated equally or not. Um, and then testers are really trained to be objective observers. One of the um, I think strengths of testing is that testers never know what it is they're testing. They never know whether um, 
they're testing a provider that's been accused of housing discrimination or they're just testing a random site um, or some, some sort of uh, systemic investigation. And they never know how their testing counterparts or the other testers that also uh, visited this site were treated. Um, so they really only have, um, they can only report their own perceptions without having that comparison um, with how somebody else was treated. And uh, a number of different entities conduct fair housing testing, private fair housing organizations, such as the Housing Equality Center, DOJ has a testing program and some um, fair housing assistance program agencies, uh, state agencies that are deemed substantially equivalent um, to HUD sometimes do testing. Um, our, our Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Human Relations Co Commission does not have a testing program, but some states uh, and localities do. So testing is either, it can be used solely for research purposes. Um, HUD for decades did a housing discrimination study, which was a nationwide testing program, just meant to assess and report on levels of housing discrimination um, throughout the country. Or it can be um, used, which I think, our, our purpose is most commonly to assess how credible an allegation of discrimination is. And sometimes we find that discrimination or difference in treatment exists. Sometimes we find that um, some sort of qualification standard, some sort of rule is being applied equally to everyone. And I think, um, Fairly often we have the experience that um, somebody will call us believing that they've been discriminated against based on kind of customer service and that they, they call because a housing provider has been unresponsive or has been um, not provided great follow through or other types of customer service and access issues. And then sometimes when we send testers, we find that that agent is unresponsive to everyone or rude to everyone or um, doesn't provide good follow-up to anyone who, um, who calls them. So I do like to, particularly when I'm talking to housing providers, say that um, testing often provides evidence of housing discrimination, but also testing often provides an indication that there is not discrimination occurring. And I think it often prevents someone from filing an unfounded discrimination complaint when, um, you know, when there is discrimination occurring because they can, you know, they can walk away from that conversation um, and say, well, you know, now I know that this is just uh, a real estate agent that should be in a different line of work because they, <laughs> they don't do their job well. Um, and so it's, you know, it's really people who call us believing they've been discriminated against generally just kind of have a feeling about it that they'll say, well, I don't know if it's discrimination, but I, I kind of feel like something was off about this transaction or this um, contact with this provider. So testing was unanimously affirmed by the Supreme Court as a necessary means of uncovering housing discrimination. There's, there's sort of a landmark case for fair housing testing, which is a, a 1982 case, which says that because the Fair Housing Act contains um, an enforceable right of any person to truthful information concerning availability of housing. That even in a situation where a tester um, 
a purchase a housing provider without the intention um, of actually buying or renting the house, that that does not deprive that person of the right to receive truthful information. So, um, you know, we, we, we definitely get <laughs> housing providers saying, you know, the, the, that this isn't, you know, that this isn't right to send people who don't have an intention of, of renting or buying to inquire about housing. Um, but the, the Fair Housing Act does say that any person has the right to truthful information and that's affirmed by the Supreme Court. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about, you know, mirroring the, uh, the categories that we talked to before in terms of protected classes, just provide a, a long, long list of examples of the types of complaint allegations that we've received based on different protected classes and the um, examples of differences that have been demonstrated through testing recently. And this is kind of, I just went through our last three-ish years of complaint allegations and testing to pull up some examples of what, you know, what it is that we're typically seeing when, when individuals call us with a complaint or when we conduct testing. So the, the first category I'm going to talk about is race. Um, and Rachel, we, yes. I'm sorry. Can I uh, just launch the second poll now as you? Um, Absolutely. All right. And I'll leave it up for another, for two minutes. There. Thank you. <laughs> Get it off my screen. <laughs> um, so one of them is that, that example I talked about previously is um, providing poor customer service or non-responsiveness to Black consumers. Another area that we receive complaint allegations is um, housing providers. This is often realtors requiring more proof of qualification to Black customers. So something like requiring a pre-approval letter from a mortgage lender before showing houses to a Black home seeker while not requiring that same type of qualification of a white tester. Um, some type of uh, misrepresentation of availability um, for either sales or rental housing provided to black customers. Somehow, somehow those polls make, make me not able to advance my slides. There we go. Uh, we've recently, um, this is something that's arisen just during COVID that in our, our really tight real estate market is um, the issue of pocket listings and listings before they're um, offered through the MLS or publicly available being um, offered specifically to a, a certain neighborhood for dissemination to their family and friends. So a lot of times we've seen um, or heard about a realtor saying on, you know, um, whatever their neighborhood Facebook group or next door group, um, you know, this is going to go in the market on the market in, you know, a week or two. In the meantime, if you have anybody who's interested, have them contact me. Um, advertising postcards that have the appearance of blockbusting. We've gotten complaints from um, individuals about those, you know, the we buy cash for homes sort of postcards or direct mail that um, seem to be possibly occurring more uh, frequently in neighborhoods where there's racial demographic change. Um, and then steering based on neighborhood or, or type of listing that we've gotten complaints from consumers who believe that they're being steered either to um, 
neighborhoods where everyone is the same race as them or they're being steered to something, you know, to look at something like uh, homes that have been foreclosed rather than um, just conventional listings. We have heard from municipalities talking about uh, real estate agents making disparaging remarks about either a neighborhood or a school district. And this is another more recent um, type of complaint that we have never received prior to just about a year ago, is that we've been getting a lot of either anonymous tips or um, consumers calling us regarding either real estate agents or lenders that have posted uh, racial content on their um, social media. So this is kind of a newly, um, another newly emerging type of complaint. And this, this would be something that would prompt us to, to test them, to see if these beliefs are um, carrying through to their uh, real estate or lending business. So just going back to look at tests that we've conducted in the last three years, in 37% of race tests that we've conducted throughout, um, this is all throughout greater Philadelphia and um, Lehigh Valley region, um, that 37% of them show differences in treatment that favor the white tester over the black tester. And Typical types of different treatment include um, voice profiling. I think the reason that the difference in treatment in race tests is so high is because we do see a high level of discrimination in the voice profiling tests. That if we have um, two testers both call and leave a message, it seems to be kind of the easiest form of discrimination for a housing provider to make is to not give everybody a call back and to be less likely to give the black tester a call back based to the sound of their voice on the phone. Um, and all of those, all of those various other types of treatment that we've talked about previously, customer service, terms and conditions, steering, and um, differences in the number, quality, and or price of listings provided. Um, a, a really common um, thing that we see, I talked about voice profiling a couple times already. Another common thing that we see is um, what I had mentioned about the pre-qualification letter. That's, that's very common that we see that in real estate tests where just that higher level of proof of qualification is required from the black tester. Comments about um, desirability of neighborhoods or school districts with a, um, you know, more discouraging comments made regarding black or mixed race neighborhoods, and then um, various steering issues, the listings in ge different geographic location. Um, as a generality, we tend to see the white testers being provided with a different price range, that they are provided with a range that goes higher than what is typically provided to black testers. Um, steering, I think probably some of you have seen this map in um, previous uh, trainings that we've done. It's actually an older, older map at this point. This came from testing that we did in the Lehigh Valley in um, 2014. And this is the example of a national origin test that was done and two testers based on their national origin being given a completely different set of listings where um, you know, there was a Mexican tester that was given test it, it, listings that were 
in and closely surrounding the city of Allentown, and then the white tester was given listings um, further out surrounding the uh, western part of the city of Allentown. And this is just a really kind of stark visual portrayal of what steering looks like in um, real estate listings. And then just kind of quality of uh, the amount of conduct, contact and the quality of contact that's offered um, that typically this type of difference in treatment would be um, the white tester being offered an in-person meeting or some more, uh, more engagement than the black tester is. Same thing with referral to other services, other related services like mortgages or homeowners insurance or just various related, you know, home inspectors and and so forth. And then um, quality and con and quantity of follow up contact. Uh, similar to that initial phone call, it also seems to be easy relatively easy for an agent or a um, lender just to not follow back up um, after that initial contact. A major uh, area that we still see discrimination is that a white tester will be given a quote for either um, homeowner's insurance or will be pre-qualified for a mortgage without having them run a credit check while the black tester is told that it's required. Um, so a white tester can often get a quote by saying, you know, I, I don't want my credit checked at this stage. Can you just kind of ballpark, um, give me a ballpark estimate? Or they'll say, you know, I ran my, you know, I, I ran my own credit check. My credit is, X number and the, um, the agent will accept that while with the black tester, they're saying that they need to check their credit. And then product steering. Um, this would be in housing related financial services where there's there are inferior products um, given to the, the black tester versus the white tester and also costlier products, generally in terms of a higher interest rate or a higher premium if we're talking about homeowners insurance. Okay, in national origin, um, as far as complaint allegations, we've had that social security number issue and usually associated with an unwillingness of the housing provider to accept alternate forms of documentation. So, you know, a tester who doesn't have a social security number to um, check credit will offer to say that they'll um, have their landlord provide proof that they paid their rent on time for the last two years and their employer will verify their income and the, the housing provider will not accept that um, in lieu of a social security number. And then requiring either larger security deposits or higher rental amounts or that prepayment of rent. We had a complaint from um, someone who said that they were being uh, required to provide two months social security or two month security deposit. And they had a white roommate who was only required to provide a one month social, one month security deposit. So in terms of national origin testing, 40% um, of tests in the past three years have shown difference in treatment. And it's, it's often the same types of treatment, different treatment than we see in race, the same voice profiling, difference in availability. But when it comes to national origin, we do have these situations where there's more blatant comments made. Um, testers being asked where they're from or comments being made about their, their name or their accent. 
so we had a recent test where um, the the tester was asked directly, you know, where are you from, and then the uh, the the agent or the landlord, it was a private landlord, said, "Well, I can't even pronounce your name. I don't think I can deal with this," and and hung up. So we do see those more blatant discrimination um, and discriminatory comments come up with regard to national origin. Um, we've seen situations where um, just qualifications regarding things like um, two testers that neither one of them has a credit history for various reasons. Um, and there's a, a willingness to work with, for example, a student um, who hasn't established a credit record, but not the same willingness to work with um, an immigrant individual or family. <coughs> so um, moving on to familial status. I think I've got three minutes left <laughs> um, that we've had complexes with no children policies with senior buildings. Our most recent familial status uh, case was a large complex in Allentown that had all of these um, <laughs> All of these qualities, they had one building that they were designating as a senior building. They had um, no one under 21 permitted through the entire complex. And then the senior, um, senior building that they did have was not um, in alignment with the, the age restrictions in the ha Housing for Older Persons Act. So we've seen some buildings that say, or some complexes that say like um, no one under the age of 45 or something like that, that is not, not compliant with the Housing for Older Persons Act. Uh, a bit of less, less of um, high percentage of familial status discrimination, but still 15% of those um, tests that we've done in the past three years show discrimination against families with children. Often there are, there are more detailed questions asked about things like, well, who watches your kids during the day? Where do they go to school? Um, you know, more detail about employment, particularly if it's a single mom who is inquiring about housing. And, um, you know, again, this is an area where we do see sometimes those blatant, uh, blatant comments, um, discriminatory comments saying we will not rent to you because of that you have children. Um, very, very quickly, just um, to give you a um, sense of disability testing, even though we, that, you know, this, was not really the focus of the presentation. Um, over 50% of our cases that we receive are based on disability. That's um, consistent with what other fair housing um, groups and also HUD receives throughout the country. And um, the two most common types of allegations that we get are either eviction due to a worsening disability or due to disability related symptoms which result in often very minor lease violations um, and then a uh, resulting um, unwillingness of the housing provider to allow more time to address those when they're disability related. And then of course, denial of reasonable accommodation requests. And for testing, 31% of tests that we've conducted in the um, last three years have showed either difference in treatment based on disability or non-compliance with something like the obligation to permit reasonable accommodations and modifications or um, non-compliance with the design and construction requirements of the Fair Housing Act. 
I'm going to just, I think I'm going to skip over the testing. I'm going to just put our, <laughs> our contact information up for you um, and just repeat that what the Fair Housing um, or what the Housing Equality Center can offer is um, assistance to individuals who have experienced housing discrimination, um, either counseling about their rights, assistance with uh, negotiating reasonable accommodations and modifications, testing investigations, if their complaint warrants that, and assistance with um, enforcement options. And then we also offer technical assistance to anybody who needs um, to have questions answered about compliance. Thank you, Rachel. And I um, I want to thank Rachel and the Housing Equality Center for being such a great resource for us. Um, and I do encourage everyone who's participating to, you know, if you have any questions to, to, to reach out to her. I'll mention that North Penn Legal um, also has a, a, a program to address fair housing questions for, for tenants and, um, um, generally the person that, that gets those those calls in those cases. And so I want to thank our funders for making that possible um, and let everyone know that that's a, a resource in the Lehigh Valley and, and um, you know, in, in the whole sort of wherever North Penn Legal Services provides um, legal services. So I didn't see any more questions coming up. I see one question. Is there any sort of uh, booklet or handout or something um, that you have, Rachel, from the Housing Equality Center to give to participants in um, public housing or just, you know, just people out in the world? So what we typically give, and let me see if I can, let me see if I can unshare and get you a link. Super, let's see how fast I can, <laughs> I can do this. We have a kind of comprehensive renters rights manual that covers both fair housing and um, I'm going to just put our whole resources link in the chat. Um, and I'm also going to put so that's our page with all of our various publications. Um, we have uh, a lot of um, a lot of publications on various topics. Some of them are more like uh, brochures and more summarizing fair housing issues. The one I linked here is a seventy something page manual on both fair housing rights for renters and um, landlord tenant rights for renters, specifically focusing on Pennsylvania. So we, um, you can download that from our website, or if you would like hard copies, you can contact us for them. And we, we do have a Spanish language version of that as well. And if I'm not mistaken, Rachel, you, you have some resources that are geared towards housing providers. Yes, to, yes. To yeah. Help them understand. Yeah, and we right now we're actually working. Um, we're working on a resource for landlords on fair housing compliance in rental situations. So we're going to have another one of those huge manuals coming out specifically for landlords within the next um, three or four months. So that that that'll be coming. And again, we'll have both. Uh, electronic version and hard copy version of that as well. Great. Well, we I look forward to, to reading that and just uh, want to respect everyone's time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you again, Rachel, for giving us all this great information. And um, you know, you you know where to reach us now, everyone. So we'll we'll close out this session, and this is going to be the final session of this year's uh, Fair Housing Summit and. Let's just hope next year we can get together in person. So thank you and Great. enjoy your day. Thank you. Take care.